Ooh, school, my friend. Well, not, not you, you watching who called the DA woke. Hello and hello, welcome to Morning Shot, welcome back. In terms of position in the DA, so John's a leader, you have a very long title, like something from the Republic of China. What is your title again? <laughs> the chairperson of the Federal Council. That's right. So how do those two positions interact with each other on the daily? So John already explained what he does, which is rather broad. What do you do? Well, my job description is also rather broad. There's a nice basket clause in the Constitution which basically says um, everything except leading the party in a direction setting the vision for the party and all of that which is John's lane primarily and solely and my job is to make sure that the interface between the administration of the Democratic Alliance and the politics works, works smoothly and that we implement what the politicians decide. So obviously the common argument is that the party is run by yourself and that John is apparently the, uh, the puppet of, of the real master, the real madam of the party, which is yourselves, what, how would you say that your interaction with, with John works on a day-to-day -day basis? Well, that allegation is absolutely absurd. And it is invented by people who somehow wish to present me as a broomstick-riding politician that controls all around me, which of course is absolutely not the case. John is obviously the leader. I take direction from him. He regularly interacts with me and points the direction in which we have to go. I regularly report to him about where we're going and I'm very careful not to get into his lane. I know exactly where his lane is. I've been in that lane before and I'm definitely not in it now. John, when are you going to give Helen back her Twitter password? <laughs> I didn't take Helen's Twitter password away. Um, uh, it, it, Helen is uh, being careful on Twitter for her own reasons because she also knows that we've got one mission and that's the moonshot election in 24 and nothing should distract us from uh, achieving that. But Helen is her own person. I don't, I don't uh, tell Helen what to do. We work together in a very collaborative way as we always have. And when Helen was the leader, I was very supportive of her. Um, when she ran for leader, I was very supportive of her. And I think we've got a very good working relationship. It's an easy working relationship because we've known and worked alongside each other and trusted each other for a very, very long time. Um, the great thing for me as the leader is having somebody who's able to dot the I's and cross the T's. Uh, that sort of granular detail, which is a huge strength of Helen's processes, um, details, making sure things running smoothly in the staffing operation, which gives a leader the opportunity to go out and lead the party. And if I was having to come back and you know, look at everything in granular detail the way Helen has to, uh, you'd never get out there to interact with people or, or do the front-facing side of the party. So I think it's a very good partnership. The other thing, particularly as we go in towards taking over more governments, and particularly the coalitions, uh, Helen is the most successful premier in post-democratic South Africa. She didn't talk about building a capable state. She did it in the Western Cape. She didn't talk about building a growing economy. She built it in the Western Cape as Premier. And you'd be absolutely crazy as any leader of a party not to have Helen's feet under the table when you're talking about taking over governments. She's got that experience, more experience than anybody in the country, I would advance, at good, effective, accountable governments according to DA values and principles. Yeah. And that's what we're trying to instill in our governments around the country. So Helen, you famously wrote a book very recently called uh, Go Woke, Go Broke. And in it, you accrued the modern turning to progressivism or wokeness, as one might describe. We have seen some policies come out of the DA that could be described as woke. We have seen forms in the, some schools in the Western Cape, say, for example, adopting the critical gender type theories. What's, what's your response to that? How, how do you view the DA's role in combating that? Well, firstly, there's nothing progressive about wokeness. Identity politics is totally regressive. It takes us back to Favudian identity politics and for some reason is dressed up now as progressive. It is anything but. It is exactly the opposite. 
And in fact, we have never gone to critical gender theory in our provinces at all. In fact, the DA has just adopted a position paper on the issue that is facing many schools, which is the rise of transgenderism in classrooms and the dilemma that many schools face in dealing with it. Mm. And then they turn to a provincial administration and say, what must we do about this? Now, our position paper says very firmly that this is the purview of governing bodies. So school governing bodies who have this power must draw up a position on it. The DA's position is very firm. We recognize that there are different biological sexes. That is a fact, a proven biological fact, otherwise you can't have reproduction. And so we do believe there are different sexes. We do believe there is such a thing as gender dysmorphia, that it is rarer than you would currently think, given what is going on. But when this emerges in schools, we have to deal with it in an appropriate and sensitive way. So, for example, we have a position on bathrooms. We do not believe that those large bathrooms in schools with different cubicles in them should be open to both sexes. We believe in gender differentiating those kinds of bathrooms, but where there are single bathrooms without internal divisions and cubicles, then, of course, anybody can go in and out of them. It doesn't make, make any difference because people don't congregate there at the same time. So that is the kind of nuance our position paper goes into. We do believe that boys' and girls' sports should be separate, for example. And we do not believe that boys identifying as girls should participate in girls' competitive sports or vice versa. So that is our position paper. There's nothing woke about it. And it rests in the fundamental belief that the wokes would reject that there is a dif difference between biological sexes. Oh, school, my friend. Well, not, not you. You watching who called the DA work. Uh, so just a final question from us. 2024 is coming up. Uh, John says it's the moonshot election. You've built coalitions in the past, as, as John mentioned, and I agree with him that you are the coalition, not expert, but you are a, a real influence in, in, in the, the coalition building aspect, especially that the DA wants to partake in. Since the local government elections last year, there's been great progress in there. There's been a, a coalition agreement. Um, you in contact with a lot of opposition parties. How is it going at the moment, creating this opposition block that might hopefully take over in 2024? No doubt there are challenges, I can understand that, but overall, is it more difficult than building a coalition in Cape Town in 2006? Or is it all the experience helping you make it a bit less of a risky prospect? While all of the experience does definitely help me, it is extremely difficult. Just take one example of Nelson Mandela Bay, where Retief Udendal was elected by 60 votes to 59. And this is a 10-party coalition. The DA has 48 seats, by far the majority. The next biggest party has only three. Then there are three parties with two seats each and five parties with one seat each. Now, when you sit with a majority of a single seat for the election of your mayor, it just takes one of those people to wake up one morning and decide to cross the floor. And usually they don't just wake up one morning and decide that. There are a lot of incentives offered by the ANC. As we know, tens of thousands of rands can change hands in these deals. And if people aren't prepared to fall for the incentives, there's always the handy death threat that gets bandied about. Mm. And in a place like Nelson Mandela Bay, where there have been many political assassinations, you don't take death threats lightly. So where you are sitting with a majority of a single seat to elect a mayor, you realize how unbelievably fragile that is. And a lot of a mayor's time in that context is spent holding the coalition together of necessity. And anybody who feels a bit hurt, feels that they haven't been adequately recognized, feels that they could get a better deal somewhere else, and sometimes feels as simple as, well, I was overlooked for this overseas trip or something, can on the flip of that switch decide to bring down the government. Now, it is an incredible weakness of the South African coalition environment that there isn't any threshold for representation to get into a coalition as there are in all the stable European coalitions, for example. Right. So we don't have the context, legislative or political, mm -hmm. that is conducive to coalitions. And that's why it makes it so difficult. And that's why so much of my time 
and several of my colleagues this time, is taken up just managing coalitions every day. From, from your perspective, in terms of the, your experience, what, what happens comes 2024, the DA is, is responsible for forming a, a coalition, and I can't do it. Let's just say, for whatever reason, I can't agree on the terms. What happens if the EFF partners with the ANC? Well, there are many options come 2024. The EFF partnering with the ANC, I don't think will happen unless the ANC splits. And if the ANC splits, there are many other possibilities that come onto the table. I think the most likely outcome is going to be an ANC-IFP coalition. Certainly, if I was the ANC, I would go for that and do what Robert Mugabe did to Joshua and Cornwall. We basically buy him out with the deputy presidency, the premiership of KwaZulu-Natal, and a handful of cabinet positions. That is the most likely thing that I think the ANC will go for. And if they get, let's say, 45 to 47 percent of the vote, and then Carter gets about 7 percent of the vote, well, you know, that's the obvious first option that the ANC would take, I would imagine. If I were in Cyril Ramaphosa's shoes, that's probably what I would try to do. But um, the ANC and a whole lot of tiny parties, the pop-up parties, that could well be an option as well. And, of course, the worst option of all is the ANC-EFF. There is a chance, and we're certainly going for that, for an opposition coalition grouping, but it's got to be stable, and the DA has to be the very strong anchor tenant of that, otherwise it can't be stable. But, you know, there's another critical thing that voters need to realise. According to the report poll that was published recently on the front page of the report, the DA is 11 or 12 percent behind the ANC nationally. Now, that is an incredibly small margin. It's the smallest difference that there's ever been. And people must realize that if they really want stable and good government, to close that gap even more, hmm. and to potentially give us an overall majority, which we actually could get, given that the differential is narrowing so dramatically, and given the fact that the ANC is likely to split in future. You've, you've famously said two million people have immigrated out of the country since the ANC's ruled, and obviously if they had stayed, that most of those people are DA supporters. So what would you say to people who are on the fence of either A, looking to immigrate, or B, considering a smaller party? Well, we're a liberal party, so we believe that people must make up their own minds and chart their own course in life. All I am saying is that we in the DA, every single one of us, works our hands to the bone to ensure that South Africa works. And you know, we are now the biggest party in urban South Africa. That's an enormous spread, uh, jump from where we last were. We are the biggest party in urban South Africa and we have DA mayors in five out of eight metros. That couldn't have been considered possible 10 years ago. So that is where we are and the prospects look better and better. So the point is that people are realizing that the quality of their government lies in their hands. They need to vote for it. And we have proof points right in South Africa, in Cape Town, in the Western Cape, in the 16 municipalities that the DA governs outright with an overall majority. There are the proof points. And more and more South Africans are getting it. Yeah, so final question from me for, for John. I, I, I made a tweet once where I said, underrate Helen's at your own peril. And uh, I'm still not going to make one about you in the same way. But, I mean, Helen has been an utter asset to the party and ups and downs and coalitions and this and this and that and, and, and the rest of the thing. How, do you think the DA would be a much poorer party if Helen... I'm like, no, she's not here, but if Helen like retired like three years ago. Undoubtedly, and that's what frustrates me the most about these people who say, well, why is Helen still there? You know, there's a time to come, there's a time to go, as some previous uh, person who's a member of our party has to say all the time, although he's now trying to make his comeback in another party. Uh, South Africa has never needed the Helen Zillas of the world more than it needs them now. We're going through a very, very shaky time. Um, the uh, steering us through coalitions forming new governments and making sure those governments deliver is the work that needs to be done. And there's nobody in the country who knows governance and coalitions better than Helen. Helen piloted coalitions in this country in Cape Town where she managed an eight-party coalition 
uh, where she was elected mayor by uh, one vote with one other party abstaining. Um, she has that experience. And uh, as long as people have got the ability to serve and have the passion and drive that people like Helen do and the love for country that Helen does, they should be serving. They shouldn't be forced into retirement or just because somebody doesn't like the fact that you are able to speak your mind or you've got strong opinions. Um, no, we need those South Africans to stand up now and be counted and to put their hands up and say, we want to make a difference in saving the country. And I'm very glad Helen didn't, uh, didn't retire three years ago. Uh, I think the incredible work she's been able to do in helping us get these coalition agreements off the ground, being able to manage some very intricate uh, realignment within the party back to our core values and principles, I think has been very, very important and invaluable. And I think that when the long arc of history looks back at Helen Ziller's career and Helen Ziller's post-leadership career in the DA, uh, it's going to be seen much more favorably than the critics uh, and naysayers and talking heads and commentary would like to, to have it said. Helen, while you're here, I don't want to blow smoke. Um, I know you have to go, but, uh, but but there's really a sense of like duty for you, almost like it's a service. It's something you have to do, it, irrespective of the costs. I'm sure the costs are great as well, but but that's rare. One would say in politics. No, there's there are no costs for me. I I love the job, and no one conscripted me. I stepped up to the plate and stood for an election, and it was a tough election, and I had wonderful support and help through Ash or Sarupan and others who helped me get elected. And I love doing the job every single day. I love South Africa. And my parents were refugees here. If it hadn't been for South Africa, they wouldn't be alive today. And I know what it does to a family to be dispersed all over the world and not to be able to raise your family in the place where they were born and to ensure that they can have dreams for the future in the country of theirs. And so it's, it's not a duty for me. It's an absolute life passion and something that I wake up to do every day. 